Good morning. Um, for those of you who have cottages and have been traveling, we are spending the summer with David. And uh, David, we just a few weeks into this series, and we, <laughs> we've covered a lot of ground. We're going to cover a lot of ground again today. Um, I will remind you that uh, David was a young, young man uh, when he was anointed king. Saul had disobeyed God. He did not take out a town that God commanded him to take out. Now, that came back to haunt the Israelites later, um, and God in his wisdom knew that that would happen. Uh, but Saul didn't do what God commanded him to do. And I want you to watch for, in the summary of chapters 21 and 22 today, what town Saul does take out. Um, wasn't commanded by God to do it, but he, he, Saul gets, Saul is the, the current king, David is not yet king, David is becoming the man that God wants him to be, and uh, <clears throat> David, we, we, we'll start t today with David in exile, because he found out that he knows that Saul's trying to kill him. His best friend, Jonathan, uh, who's Saul's son, uh, informs David for sure that Saul wants to kill him. So David is on the run for years. Um, but I want you to watch, if you would, in this process of what, where David goes when he flees and who he consults and who, who Saul consults when he's in pursuit of David. Because the author's intent here is for us to see one man following after God's will and another man trying to prevent God's will for someone else and following his own will, his own passions, and his own paranoia, to be quite honest. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, and we're going to get on this, or we're going to get in this. And I'm going to summarize chapters 21 and 22. We're going to read chapter 23. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for who you are, for what you do for us, for what you do in us, and for what you do through us. Even when we don't cooperate with you the way we should, you're always playing the long game. You're always reminding us that you and you alone are the author of time and the future. Lord, I want to thank you this morning for the, the nation that you've put us in, the freedom to stand up on a Sunday morning, to read your scriptures, and to proclaim your word to sing songs of worship, um, and no one's waiting outside to take us and jail us. Um, Lord, we all feel like it's changed some, a lot, in the last 20 to 30 years, but currently we still have the freedom to worship the God we love. We bless you for that, and we know that you're the one who has the provision to keep that freedom available to us, and we pray that you do. Lord, as we hear your word read, summarized and read, and the, the words on top of that, that that you want to communicate to us, we ask you to give us ears to hear it, eyes to see whatever you want to show us, and hearts to receive whatever you want to give us. We only want what you want to give us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week, David... Um, on three different, time, three different attempts, Saul made three different attempts on David's life. He tried to pin him to a wall with a spear. <clears throat> and David was out of favor, back in favor, out of favor, and remains out of favor now. Um, Jonathan, Saul's son, David's best friend, they have pledged, uh, pledged their uh, fealty to each other. Uh, they are loyal to each other. They made a covenant uh, between each other, and they've even communicated, it, it's been verified a few times or, or uh, affirmed a few times that the Lord himself is the witness to what we're, what, what we've made, this covenant we've made with one another. And Jonathan's understanding of this, because Jonathan is supposed to be the heir to the throne, um, but he knows that God has anointed David Jonathan's heart is with David and not with his dad. And Jonathan has said on one occasion for sure, maybe two, and there'll be a third um, this week, that you're going to be the king and I'm going to be number two to you. Uh, my dad knows it. You know it. We all know it. So Jonathan and David are like brothers. And we find out here next week that Jonathan doesn't make it. So we're going to hear today 
something that Jonathan did for David when David is in exile, and it will be the last time, according to the biblical story, that they see each other. So what we read last week, the last verse said that then David left and Jonathan went back to town. So David left, and now he is indeed on the run and in in exile. So David, uh, he flees for his life. He's all alone. He's got no men with him. He's got no servants with him. He's got no boy to chase after arrows with him like Jonathan did last week. He's just alone. And notice where he goes. He heads to to the town of Nob, and it's not Nob, it's Nob because... We know Job looks like Job, but it's Job. And then there's a word in Scripture, uh, Tob, uh, which means good. It's the same kind of pronunciation. So he runs off to a place called Nob. And he speaks to a priest of Nob, Ahimelech. And he asks, he concocts a bit of a story as to why he's there. Ahimelech's a little scared. Why, 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 why is da- David is here? And where are your men? And David concocts a bit of a story, like I'm on urgent business from the king, um, and it was so urgent that I, I didn't come with my sword, I didn't come with any provision, have you got some food for me, and I need a sword. And Ahimelech says, I don't have any food, I only have the bread of the presence of the Lord. So every day they would make fresh bread, and they would put it uh, before the, whatever the altar was in Nob, they'd put it before the, the Lord, and it was there to, you know, when we talk sometimes about... Um, May our prayers and our praise be like sweet incense to your nose to rise up. The bread of the presence of the Lord is to, is to, to be that aroma um, to float up to God so that God then in turn smiles upon his people and his presence is with them. So the fact that, that he had just replaced the bread and so he has these loaves that he gives to David, um, he wanted to make sure David and his men weren't uh, ritually unclean, anything like that. But the author's very careful to make sure that he didn't just say, yeah, I have some bread that used to be on the altar. It's the bread of the presence of the Lord. So that is the author communicating to us that yet again we see and are reassured that God is with David and David is in the will of God. And then we don't know how it got there, uh, but he, the, the only sword he had was the sword of Goliath. So David said, there's none like it, give it to me. Now David knew that that would... That it's, a, it's, a, it's a big weapon, but as he carries it around in his exile, people will be reminded of who David is and what he's done. And the sheer size of the sword and the, the, the craftsmanship of the sword brings with it some sense of power and authority. That's chapter 21. Chapter 22, uh, David, after he leaves Ahimelech, the priest in Nob, with the bread of the presence of the Lord and the sword of Goliath, he's trying to get out of the, the sphere of influence of Saul. So he heads into enemy territory, to Gath. And there, um, they recognize him. And the king doesn't like what he, he, he... This is David. I mean, he's the one that's been slaying our people. He's the one that always has victory. And David realizes that they're a little worried about him, so he pretends to be insane. Quite literally, it says he would make marks with his hands on the gates... And he allowed spittle to run down his beard. Now, what's funny about that to me, not that David had to pretend to be insane or that he even concocted that idea, but the, the, king, uh, the king of Gath said something like, why is this man here? And he's, he's, he's a madman. Do I not have enough madmen in my midst? So that kind of tells you a little bit about Gath, that they have a bunch of crazy people. Um, so he realizes what's going on and, and David does, and he realizes he's not safe there and not that he thought he would be because it's his enemies, but, um, he's on the run. And so he leaves Gath and he heads toward Adullam word gets, now that's not that all that far from his, where his family lived in Bethlehem word gets somehow to his family that David is hiding out in Adullam and his brothers and his parents. And then the words used in chapter 22 all those that are distressed, discontent, or in debt, meaning in debt within the kingdom, they all come to David. There's about 400 of them. And they come to David, and that, those 400 men, there's, there's women and children too, but the 400 men become the loyal guard of David, and most of them go right with him all the way through his reign. Meanwhile, Saul gets more and more paranoid. 
in all of his military regalia, he's got his spear, he's got his stuff on, he starts accusing his men of how, why didn't my, my own son makes a covenant with David and none of you tell me about it? And he's out there and in, in, in his paranoia, he starts telling his men that David is out to kill Saul. Now, that's a reversal, but that's not what's going on. Um, it's what Saul believes is going on. So, in the midst of all of that, he's saying, none of you have told me anything. You know, I, I'm going to pull away some of my gifts from you. He does it in, in, a, in a way of questioning. He's, he says, will David do this for you? Will David do this for you? Will David do this? Can David do this? Um, he's threatening to take stuff away. Now, there's a guy that witnessed um, David's interaction with Ahimelech in Nob, and his name is Doeg, D-O-E-G. I just don't want to say Doug because Pastor Doug is not this kind of man. So I'm going to go with Doeg. So Doeg sees a political opportunity because um, he, he wasn't, he, he was around the king. I think he was the, the, the chief shepherd or something like that. He's not a really, oh, he's not like the commander of the king's army. He's not like a cupbearer or some, someone that's really close to the king. So he sees a political opportunity after um, Saul has been accusing his own men in his own paranoia um, Doeg sees, sees an opportunity that he speaks up, says, I saw David at Ahimelech in Nob, <clears throat> and Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for David. So Saul wants Ahimelech and all of his brothers, because it was a whole family of priests, all of his brothers and all of his children and all of their, all the men to come, they bring, bring them to me, says Saul. So Saul accuses Ahimelech of conspiring against him. Now, keep in mind, the story was that David fled to Ahimelech. Ahimelech did not know why David was there, did not know that he was in exile. He just did what any priest would do, and he helped out one of the king's men. But in Saul's mind, if you had any interaction with, with, with David, whether you knew that he was in exile or not, you should have communicated that to me immediately. So Ahimelech tells him that that. Tell Saul that, look, when he was, David is your loyal servant. He admits to helping him, uh, and he admits to inquiring of the Lord. <clears throat> he tells Saul that he knows nothing about, how's that? I know nothing about all this whole affair, meaning his paranoia, the accusations, and all that kind of stuff that's going on with Saul. Saul orders his men to kill Ahimelech and all of the priests of Nob. And his men say, we will not kill the priests of the Lord. So he turns to this new informant, Doeg, and he says, you do it. And he did. He put to the sword 85 priests of Nob. And then, unlike when God told him to take out a whole town, Saul orders that the whole town of Nob be destroyed. He killed every man, every woman, every child, every infant, every cow, donkey, and sheep. One, and only one priest of Nob, escaped. He was one of the sons of Ahimelech. His name is Abiath, Abiathar, Abiathar, I don't, I don't know how to say it. Saul, um, Abiathar fled, and he knew where David was, which I always find curious that David's family knew how to find him, that a priest who escaped uh, a, a holocaust, basically, um, he knows where to find David, but Saul has trouble ever finding David. So Abiathar shows up to David's camp, and he tells him that, that Saul has killed all the priests of Nob, and has destroyed, wiped out the entire town, and that he's the only one that escaped. And David took responsibility. He goes, I knew, I, 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 kinda, I knew that Doeg was going to tell Saul when I saw him, when I was meeting with Ahimelech, he goes, it's my responsibility. You stay with me um, because your life is in danger. My life's in danger too, but you'll be safe with me. And this brings us to chapter 23. Chapter 23 reads like this. When David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Calah. And eluding the threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord. Notice that David keeps inquiring of the Lord. Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord answered him, go, attack the Philistines and save Calah. 
But David's men said to him, here in Judah we're afraid. How much more then if we go to Cala and against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered him, go down to Keilah, for I'm going to give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keilah, fought the Philistines, and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Keilah. And now there's this little parenthetical phrase. <clears throat> it says, now Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, had brought the ephod down with him when he fled to David in Keilah, or at Keilah. So just a quick little thing here. <clears throat> Number one, it tells you something about the character of the man David, that he's on the run. He has this ragamuffin group of people, the indebted, the, the, the disenfranchised, the people that are bitter toward the government, <clears throat> and all the things that are going on. These are his men. Now, we don't know exactly how much time passed in all this, but if you're on the run from the king and he wants to get you, the Lord has kept you away for a while, but you get word that the Philistines are attacking another town. If you're on the run, do you think you go rescue these people? Or is that not the king's job? But David, as we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, there's this, there's this definition of a man in the Old Testament. It shows up first with Adam. It's not, it's not explicitly written out, but it's basically this. A godly man takes responsibility for himself and those around him, leads courageously, and expects God's greater reward in the future instead of reward for himself now. This is an example of David being the kind of man, becoming the kind of man that God wants him to be. He takes responsibility for the death of Ahimelech in the whole town of Nob. He takes responsibility for Abiathar and gives him safe harbor, safe haven. And he takes responsibility for a town that will probably, we'll find out in a minute, are going to turn him, they, they seek to turn him in so that Saul doesn't come and destroy their town like he did the town of Nob. But David inquires of the Lord. The Lord says, yes, go. His men are scared. To our knowledge, they haven't had any battles together yet. So David inquires of the Lord again, do you want us to go do this? And he said, yep, and I'll take care of it. I'll hand, I, I'll hand, them, hand them over to you and rescue the people of Kilia. Now, this ephod thing is going to come into play in a moment. So priests, war, warriors have a breastplate in that time. Um, and we always, you know, we, we hear about it in the, in the, the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. But um, that's, that's where that term comes from. This ephod was like a breastplate that the priests wore. And it was made of linen, so it's not like armor, but it, it, it fell over them. And in some of the pockets were these little things that, that when you inquired of the Lord a yes or no kind of a question, or shall I go or shall I not, um, it's almost like casting lots. This is how you get your answer. So later, and you'll hear it, David says, bring the ephod. It's because he's going to inquire of the Lord. And it's, again, one of the author's way of saying that if David is inquiring of the thing that used by the priest to inquire of God, then David is seeking God's will and God's presence is with David. It's, it's reiterated over and over and over again through this whole thing. Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah and he said, <clears throat> God has handed him over to me. For David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. And Saul called up all his forces for battle to go to the town of Keilah to besiege David and his men. Nice way of making that whole town of Keilah suffer for the man that he wants to go get. When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring the ephod. And he said, O Lord, God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, God of Israel, tell, me, tell your servant. And the Lord said, yeah, Saul's coming, he will. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to the men, uh, and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, they will. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he didn't go down there. David stayed in the desert strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. 
Day after day, Saul searched for, for him, but God did not give David into his hands. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, again, I, I find it curious that Saul and his men cannot find David, but his own, Saul's own son, Jonathan, has no trouble. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said, my father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel. I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. The Ziphites went up to Saul in Gibeah and said, is not David among us in the strongholds of Horesh on the hill of Hakilah, south of Jeshimon? Man, there's a lot of words. Now, O king, come down whenever it pleases you to do so, and we will be responsible for handing him over to the king. And Saul said, now notice, Saul does not inquire of the Lord. Saul inquires of his spies. Saul replied, the Lord bless you for your concern for me. Go and make further preparation. Find out where David usually goes and who, uh, and who has seen him there. They, they tell me that he's very crafty. Find out about all the hiding places he uses and come back to me with definite information. Then I will go with you, and if he is in the area, I will track him down among all the clans of Judah. So they set out, and they went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the desert of Moan, or Maon in the <laughs> Arabah south of Jeshimon. Saul and his men began to search. When David was told about it, he went down to the rock and stayed in the desert of Maon. When Saul heard this, he went into the desert of Maon in pursuit of David. Now Saul was going along one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side, hurrying to get away from David, or hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his forces were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, Come quickly, the Philistines are raiding the land. Then Saul broke off the pursuit of David and went to meet the Philistines. That is why they call this place Selah Hamelikoth. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. Now, Selah Hamelikoth just means rock of escape. So it's in that spot that God sent a messenger to tell Saul to, that the Philistines are attacking. Now, it's interesting that no one told Saul that the Philistines were attacking Calah, but so Saul is starting to get paranoid. He's relying on his own wisdom. He's relying on the loyalty of his own people, and he's relying on spies and espionage to figure out who, where David is. And he, and he wants to be so certain that when he does get David, nothing can keep him from having victory. So Saul is obsessed with himself. And while he does not destroy the, the city that God had commanded him to destroy, he is willing to kill every priest in a town and then kill all the men, women, and children of the town. So Saul is all in, all gone. David, on the run, has loyal men, and each time in this segment inquires of the Lord. He has the one remaining priest from the, from the slaughter of all the priests. He's given him shelter. He's given him provision. And he's given him a voice at the table of the man who will be king. What does this tell us? It's a great contrast of what it looks like, the development or the downfall of a man, a woman, a child, doesn't matter, but in this case, it's Saul, the man, when he loses the Lord's favor and decides to make his will be done. In the contrast with David, who was just a boy when God anointed him, and he says that he's a, he's a man after my own heart, David has nothing. He has no power, he has no authority, but he has the one who does. He has the presence of the Lord, he has a priest of the Lord, and he can go to the Lord and say, shall I do this? Will this take place? David is always seeking 
to do God's will. Now, we know David's life. We know that there will be times when he chooses to, to, to do his will and not God's. But this is one of the reasons that Jesus comes from the line of David. And when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, Father, if you can take this cup of suffering, this cup from me, do, yet not my will, but yours be done. That is what David is known for. So my question to all of us, not to you, but to us, are we people, not just inquire of the Lord, but are we people seeking to do God's will or seeking to do our own? Another way of looking at that is, sometimes we go, I don't want to do what's not in God's will, and we think that's enough. But doing what's not in God's will not doing what's not in God's will is not the same as seeking what God's will is and trying to participate in that. There's the negative side, I don't want to sin. And there's the positive side, I want to seek righteousness and purity. I want to seek all the fruit of the Spirit. It's a story of a man who basically goes insane because he does not follow the will of the Lord anymore. He, he's embittered, he's alone, but he has many men. He's trying his hardest to, to quell the very thing that God has said will be. He wants to take out the future king. He wants his son to, 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 to get the throne, but his own son has said, I don't want it. I want this man to have it, and I want to serve him. This man says, not your will, but mine be done. And David, at least at this point in his life, is saying, not my will. He doesn't have one. He's just running around. He's just trying to live. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. He's willing to risk his own men to go save a city that, is gonna, that would turn him in if they had the opportunity. He did it. He took responsibility for himself and those around him. He led courageously, and he expects God's greater reward in the future. Do we live like that? It's an easy question. I don't think that I always do. I'm not even sure I most of the time do. Take responsibility for myself and those around me. Lead courageously, no matter the cost, expecting that God will reward in the future. That is David at this point in his life. And the contrast of that, the opposite of that, is Saul. For the men in the room, which one of those men would we prefer to be like? And for all of us, are we living with the idea, not just that I'm not, I don't, it's not just that I don't want to sin, am I going to pursue righteousness? I don't want to not do the will of the Lord, but am I seeking to do God's will in every occasion? I don't know. I hope so. But it's worth asking each of us, each of us asking the question. So today, if you have a Sunday afternoon nap, or tonight when your toothpaste hits the toothbrush, ask the Lord, am I more like David? Or am I more, more like Saul? Inquire of the Lord. You'll know. And if it's more like Saul, confess it, repent of it, and ask God to give you the courage and the wisdom to pursue righteousness instead of sin. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you again for all that you've done for us, all that you do in us, and all that you will do through us. Give us the courage to take responsibility for ourselves and those around us, to lead no matter the cost, and to expect your reward in the future instead of seeking rewards for ourselves right now. Help us be more like David and less like Saul. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.